All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Lions Got a Podcast. And today I've got my Dr. I was going to call you Mr. <laughs> got Dr. <laughs> See, I told you I screw up names on these stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Dr. Jerome Craig on the show. And uh, Jerome is a fellow high performance coach. And uh, he and I crossed paths because I was looking for an expert in what I call fasting. And so I, I reached out because I wanted to get someone on to talk about this. It's a part of my life. And, and uh, Dr. Craig was you know, gracious enough to come on and talk about it. And he's an expert in it. So that's why I wanted to get on here. So, so Jerome, let me know, let us know uh, who you are, where you come from, what do you do? I appreciate it, Dale. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here speaking to a fellow high performer. (laughs) So what do I do? Well, I am, I'm a chiropractor by trade. That's why I got my doctor honorific. I mean, you can just call me Jerome. I'm not your doctor. But, you know, what I would say is I came to this world of fasting and nutrition through my work as a chiropractor, just getting really frustrated with the inflamed state that people are showing up in. You know, you can do all the manual therapies and adjust people till the cows come home. But if they're not taking care of things at home, it's uh, kind of just going around and around in circles. So I got way more into nutrition and I've always had an interest in nutrition and nutrition's one thing. But there's, it's not just about what you eat, right? It's also about when you eat. And that's not the only thing to, you know, there's the what, the how, the when, the why. There's all important questions. But I came to fasting realizing that people weren't allowing their body enough time to heal. And the truth of the matter is, even if you're eating a very, very clean diet, it's a stressful situation to the body. The body's got to upregulate a variety of mechanisms, take care of things to break the food down, to make it into you because we are what we put in our mouths. Mm. And so I was frustrated in many senses. And about seven, eight years ago, I started working with extending fasts in clinic, like just telling people, well, maybe eat less often. Let's do this. And It was pretty profound. A lot of people had pretty good changes uh, quickly in their lives and felt some empowerment over food, over cravings and time and all those other things. So it's something that has just become way more um, visible on the social sphere. Everyone's got a fasting idea. There's a lot of people doing really hardcore fasts. And there's other people who are just a little bit confused where they should start, if this is right for them. And so I've spent my time not getting super granular into the mechanisms of it, but really breaking it down to a basic level. So it's a safe thing for people to do. Yeah, I, th- I think that's awesome. That's why I wanted to talk to you about it, because you know my experience has been, and, and look, it, it I'll, I'll be full disclosure. It was like a stupid internet video, somebody trying to sell like some workout program. And a guy's like, he said something, he said... I eat the way our bodies were intended, you know, the way to the the dawn of huma- like early ages, you know, ancient yeah. times. He was like, we didn't eat the way we eat today. We ate like we were the hunters and gatherers that we are. And and I was like, that's interesting. And and I went down the rabbit hole of the internet, going, what are we talking about here? And 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 it caused me to start going, okay, cool. And I found like, you know, I do a sixteen eight. I I you know, I eat for it from twelve to eight, and then I don't eat for sixteen hours. So and and it works for me, you know. Um, but uh, man, I feel like right away I felt better. Um, you know, I I leaned out better. And and what I learned, and I guess before we get into all this, everyone listening, like don't do anything without talking to your doctor, <laughs> right? Like don't take our word for it. You know, don't change your diet or do anything crazy just because I said so just for, or anything you hear me go, go, go talk to your doctor. But, you know, but I, I was like, okay, you know, and I started doing it and I felt great. And I, I, I felt like I was leaning out, like what I had learned. And I say all this, so you can fix me. Right. What I, yeah. what I read was, okay, after 12 hours, your body in- enters a fasted state and it starts burning body fat and body fat's a better fuel. It's a more efficient fuel. And I was like, okay, cool. So, it, it, you know, I'm going to operate more efficiently. I'm going to be burning body fat, you know, whatever. And I don't know if it was just placebo or what, but I definitely felt myself, I could see myself leaning out more, um, in a positive way. Um, and, uh, you know, I just felt more en- energetic. Um, and I, took it and kept it. And then I learned some other stuff along the way, but like, what say you, what's, what's right and wrong with, with all that? Well, there, there's several things that you said there that 
that spark something. A, and this is a, an aside, you know, the don't do this without speaking to your healthcare professional first. I, I think there's a good intent there. It's a protective thing. But at the same time, most of your healthcare pro professionals don't really care when you eat. <laughs> so we got to take responsibility and power back to ourselves and learn how to make a informed personal decision about health. And I think sure. that there are medical conditions that if you are struggling with and you're seeing a professional for care and you're taking a variety of medications, that you may want to pay closer attention to that. Now, you hop right in. You're a metabolically healthy, relatively young individual. You can do that. You exercise. You have muscle mass. You, you have reserves in the system. So for somebody like you to just hop right in, that's probably fine. But if you are a sick person, you're a person who's on a crazy roller coaster of energy fluctuations throughout the day, you need to take a more strategic, sensible approach to doing any of this. Now, there's a few reasons why it's so popular. A, the internet and social media influences all over the place, you know, it's, it's everywhere nowadays. Hmm. The other thing is, we know that as a society, we are metabolically broken these days. You know, there's so much metabolic disease that it's taking some attention back to focusing on how we eat and what are we doing to our physiology when we eat and what does that look like when we don't eat? And what and if I could pause you for a minute? What is what do you mean when you say we're so plagued with metabolic disease? Like what do you mean by that? What are we what are we talking about? Okay, well we're looking at, you know, pre-diabetes and diabetes, those are the obvious ones. Those are really, really rampant these days. I don't have the current statistics because I don't think it serves us to talk about the statistics of disease. I think we need to focus on the statistics of who's healthy, right? Mm -hmm. But there was a uh an article a couple of years back that looked said that basically 12% of the population was metabolically healthy, mm -hmm. meaning that they were functioning well. Their blood glucose was under control. They weren't obese. They didn't have, you know, elevated triglycerides or some sort of derangement in their blood work. So I think that we have to look at, is this about restoring health? And I think that is where this conversation about fasting or time-restricted eating patterns play a big role. And in this conversation, prior to hitting record, we've, we've made, I made a differentiation between a fast and a time-restricted eating pattern. Now, it's probably just semantics. You know, a lot of people are going to consider fasting is, in, in a essence, not eating, right? Sure. But the term intermittent fasting means that it's intermittent. And by definition, intermittent doesn't mean all the time. Hmm. So we all intermittent fast, but if we create a pattern to it, is it intermittent anymore? Or is it something that serves that pattern and a rhythm to life? And that's where time-restricted eating comes in. And I think this is where most people will get the benefit. Now, intermittent fasting could mean extended fasting intermittently once a week i don't eat for a day or sure. every month i do a 3 day fast that would be more intermittent to me so this is this is a differentiation i make because i think it creates a more nuanced conversation and yeah um, i think that, i think that helps right because it is I, I have friends that do like these long days worth of fast or whatever and i because i want to dive into that too and I, I, we're definitely not talking about the same thing. Like we're both talking about what I do, but I don't do that. I, like you said, I'm every day, uh, you know, I eat for eight and I don't eat for 16. So in your descriptions or, or definitions of it, that, that is time restricted eating compared mm -hmm. to possibly fast. I'm, I fast for a day once a week or whatever the case may be. Yeah. The, um, no, I you go ahead. I was just going to say, so this is an important kind of thing to differentiate. Like, when do you do one versus the other? Mm. And, you know, I think that multi-day fasting, those people probably to make that work for them, to have it feel good and successful and healthy, 
they had to start where you started, you know, where you are. Sure. You have to have some sort of restriction or window. They don't go from, you don't go from the couch to running a marathon, right? You train. And that's what time restricted eating is about is you can train your body how it functions best. And then if you want to push that barrier further, this is the place to start. So what, what is the benefits of it? Right. So let's, and let's stick with you're, you're healthy. You don't have any concerns, you know, uh, what, what is the benefits in, in your opinion of, you know, let's go with the time restricted eating first. What, like what's the benefits of, of that? Well, I think one of the main benefits is what we've already kind of alluded to is that it just gives your body a break. Your body is constantly on, right? It's got many things, multiple biological processes happening at every single cell throughout the day. It's just, it never stops. So this is about sustaining energy and giving your body what it needs, but also giving it the recuperation time. So the digestive system, it, you know, a lot of us just treat it as like garbage disposal in a blender. You know, we just throw yeah. things in, turn it on and thinks it's all going to just come out like a pretty smoothie on the other side or something. But it, it's a very, very complex biological process. And it's very expensive to the body, meaning an energy way. So just taking a break is the best thing you can do to allow your body to heal. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, well, I take a break every night. I don't eat. Well, it's true. But if we look at some of the, the surveys that have been done over time, you know, um, there's a place called Salk Institute, and they're really into this chronobiology, looking at how the body's rhythms fluctuate throughout the day. And it's about circadian rhythm and all of that. But they did a survey where they found that the average American was eating about 15 hours a day. So there's like this constant grazing, you know, and then if we slap on eight hours to 15, well, you know, we, we're coming up a little short on what we are really allowing. That's like you started eating when you woke up and you, yep. you stopped eating when you were going to bed. Which I can that's see it. That's typical, ideal. right? Like that's what you see. Like people get up, I'm hungry or they're, they're grabbing a, a sugar filled coffee and, and creamer and then breakfast and then snack and lunch. I mean. I, when you say that, I go, yeah, that's it. People eat the, from the time they get up till the time they go to bed. All the time. So, so just to get back to the benefits, you know, that's the primary benefit. It's just allowing your body some time to recuperate, heal, digest, work on what you've already given it and take care of that. The other thing that became, um, it's, it's very popular to talk about autophagy, right? This idea of cellular clean up as people think about it. But autophagy is a process that's going on all the time. Autophagy, self-eating. And it's not just like you're gobbling up whole cells. It's where you're going in and you're like taking a little protein that's running some sort of mechanism inside of a cell and it's a little faulty and not working and your body will clean it up and replace it and, and do that kind of thing. Cell gobbling up is a different process, you know, and that's lysis and apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. You have these cells that develop like a senescence. They get aged and they need to be taken out of the system and replaced with something new. But autophagy is going on at all times. Now, this was popular because it was um, a popular topic in science because there was a Nobel Prize about autophagy and labeling the mechanisms. And Nobel Prizes awarded typically decades after the discovery, right? Mm. So this was, I think, 2015. Don't quote me on that. But there was about a discovery that was 40 years in the past. And just looking at these mechanisms that happen and, and how it happens. So people got really excited about this. And there's a lot of conversation about how fasting enhances autophagy. And it is true, it can enhance autophagy. But as I already mentioned, autophagy is an ongoing process. Mm. So if we want to think about cleaning house, shoving something in the mouth is going to delay house cleaning. Sure. It's just there's too many resources being shunted to two different, too many different places. So that enhancing autophagy, that cellular cleanup um, is very, very important. And it can be enhanced in short fasts or long fasts. But typically the benefit 
beyond the 36 hour fast for somebody like you would be negligible. Sure. Someone who's very, very sick and is carrying around 200 extra pounds, that longer fast might be better for getting that autophagy signal really, really cleaned up. Because what they're doing is they're giving their body a signal to utilize that stored energy on their body. So that comes to the next thing. <laughs> the benefit of fasting is you have to tell your body to unpack the storage, which is excess body fat is a storage, you know, elevated glucose in the liver or anything like that. You've got to give your body a signal to unpack that and utilize it. And that's where fasting comes in. If I've got a lot of potential energy stored on me, aka your fat, or whatever some people will say, you got to give your body a reason to understand. That's what we're going to say down. I'm not, I'm not fat. I'm just storing extra energy for when I need it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that, and then comes that whole um, obesity paradox where sure. obese people tend to survive longer going through death while they just got a lot more storage, you know, mm. through it. And but yeah, so so the point is, I think one of the big reasons fasting is super popular is this whole idea about weight loss. And it's, it's almost just like a little mental trick that people have played on themselves. They're like, I maybe eat too much, but instead of cutting down what I'm eating, I'm just going to cut down the time that I eat. In. And they do that, and then naturally they end up eating less because they're not grazing throughout the day. And oftentimes these snacky foods that we use to graze throughout the day stimulate appetite. Because they, the protein level is pretty diluted. It's very processed, carby kind of stuff that, you know, almost stimulates hunger. It's designed to do that. You know, it's mm. addictive. It's sugars and salts and processed stuff that just stimulates pleasure centers of the brain. And that's why people overeat. Because they're just, they're just, you know, and, and it's because of the things like sugar, I... And you can correct me on this for, you know, and I've been saying it forever, so hopefully I'm not too wrong, but it's like, but I would tell people like, you know, that, that can of soda is 300 calories, right? And when I do the math, like I got to run a mile to burn a hundred calories. So for every yeah. freaking can of soda you're drinking, you got to go <laughs> run three miles to get that off. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's a, you know, you're constantly just like taking in all this excess, right? In your body. So, so, so let's fix the words again. You were saying it's called atrophy or what was it called uh, again autophagy autophagy, autophagy and that's your yeah. body cleansing out the bad cells was that what that part was yeah it's not just the cells it's just like even little tiny pieces organelles within the cell you know if you look at a, a cell on the cellular level it is a hugely active thing it's not just hanging out there you know sure. it's letting things in and out it's metabolizing it's excreting it's doing all sorts of stuff at all times so like you know if we have a car that's running 24 7 for the entire life of the car you think pieces are going to get worn out and need to be replaced sure it's a similar thing that's happening in the human body this yeah. is life this is the essence of life is is repair and healing mm, right? yeah I mean, if we, so, if we broke down and just faded away, that'd suck. <laughs> so yeah, this, so, is body, this is the body just doing its job. Right. And, and, and I'm just trying to recap this just to make sure I get it. And you're saying that process, when we give, our, when we're not eating, our body is says, okay, you know, I, I have, now I can get this done. You know, I don't have to go con you know, take care of that 300 calorie soda full of salts and all this other processed junk and whatever, or even just a meal like that. Cause I, like, even when you said that, like you said, the analogy of like, we treat our bodies like a garbage disposal. I was like, yeah, you know, as opposed to like the food we're taking in is the fuel source, right? Like being more intentional with what we're eating and why, as opposed to just dumping it in, dumping it in, dumping it in your body. Can't, can't handle that. It's too much. Yeah. And so you speaking about something that I like to talk about is sustenance. You know, the, the definition of sustenance is to build something, right? And, and I think of that as a good way to think about the human body. I'm a bodybuilder, right? I'm building this body. Yeah. Not by going to the gym, not by aspiring to be Arnold. I'm just thinking this is my only true possession. This is all I have to carry me through this life, right? So Sustenance is a very, very important thing. Nutrition is a science and it gets into calories and, you know, nutrients and all of that kind of stuff. And we don't even know what we don't know. 
I mean, we think that it's all figured out, but it's not. Sure. So I like to think about sustenance as how am I building myself? And that makes me approach nutrition in a different way. And I, I try to get my patients to think about it. Then. But that is a separate discussion from fasting. So I don't want to get all, too far off track here because sure. I, I do think that, you know, that cellular mechanism and cleanup thing, as it is going on every day and a healthy person has obviously got that going on better than an unhealthy person, right? Because a, a healthy body will function better. That's not rocket science. It's just thinking about things, you know, if you, but I can enhance that, Yep. that process by giving myself a break. So I'm not fighting too many battles and too many fronts. Right. And as you said, you know, taking in a, a can of soda and downing that, that's going to create a huge hormonal neuroendocrine kind of melee. You know, your body's going to have to deal with that because you don't carry that much sugar around in your bloodstream at once. Your body's going to have to process it. You're going to pee out a bunch of sugar. You're going to have to do something with it if you're not metabolizing it through healthy muscles and normal active metabolism. Yeah. And I think you, you're spot on something like in, in, it's amazing how much it feels like we're learning about how capable our bodies is or like our, in neurology and like, but, but yeah, I mean, even as you say it, I'm going, yeah, you know, this, this poison effect, right? Like our bodies are capable of so much, but we throw that poison in now it's gotta, it's gotta go to war, you know, to keep with that analogy, like it's gotta go to war to solve for that. Right. You like, you just point, like you took in all this poison, like you took in too much sugar, your body isn't designed or shouldn't have that much in its bloodstream at time. So now all your cells and all that stuff has to go to war to fix it. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah. thanks, you know, now it's got to go to war. It's got to ex expend all this energy to try to, and I would imagine it can't, it, you know, it's doing what it can, but maybe that's where the, the, the poor health comes in because maybe too much, right. It can't handle it. It's, it's not processing it effectively or it's, 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 it's consumed your body's, you know, uh, consumed with trying to deal with the, the, the poor energy or poor food, poor diet, whatever you're putting in it. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, and, and to bring it back into this idea of fasting, that it is very, very trending these days. And you have one camp that will like warn you against the dire side effects of fasting and how you're starving yourself and you're going to just break down your lean tissues and you know that's deranged eating pattern and then you have the other people who are like you want to talk about deranged eating pattern feeding yourself 24 7 you know all of that that's deranged yeah. that's an eating disorder too so the point in this having this discussion and coming on to this is talk about finding that sweet spot that works for you right because too often we do what somebody else is doing, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, look at so-and-so. This influencer is doing these seven-day water fast challenge on, you know, Instagram. I'm going to hop in and join. And like, you know, just because they d have done it and they do it well, and it's kind of that iceberg analogy, all you're seeing is what's sticking out. You don't see everything else that went into the background, what their health was like before they did all this kind of stuff. So I think... I just want to bring it back to that kind of sensible approach. And we've talked about a few of those things. And I think you can train yourself to be a really, really good time-restricted eater. Or you can also train yourself where an extended fast really benefits you. But you got to understand that this is just one lever. Fasting is a tool. It's one lever that you can pull. Sure. And it's probably not the first lever that people need to pull. Right. Okay. So, you know, that, that's where it comes into the bigger discussion about health. It's like, am I sleeping well? You know, how's that affecting my metabolism, my energy, my cravings for food, my glycemic control? All of those things are highly dependent upon your rhythm in life and, and sleep. You know, am I meeting my basic caloric needs? Like, am I getting enough protein? You know, my building blocks of this awesome human body. Am I getting enough micronutrients, you know, those minerals that are important to neurological function, to hormonal function, to your overall energy? There's so many things that we need to take into account before we just like, all right, I'm fasting. This is this is the key. 
This is a panacea. This is the tool that's going to make everything better for me. And I think that is the one thing that I feel like we need to have a little bit more discussion about and not on this podcast necessarily, but as a society, because we're always looking for the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And we're always trying something that's trending without really understanding what the intention is, right? Like you and I, we are high performance coaches. What's the first thing that we think about is like developing clarity yeah, and understanding why you're going to do something is key to before you even embark on it. Because how are you going to achieve your goals if you don't even know why you're doing it or you don't even know what you want? Yeah. And I think even podcast about fat episode about fasting aside, like I'm glad you brought that up because it's something like as a coach, I do talk to folks because I say, hey, I'm not here to give you my playbook and get you to copy and do what I do, right? I don't believe in that. I believe what works for me works for me. And I want to help people find what works for them. Like, what's your system? And and I'm I'm by all means, I'll give myself as an example, or we can find ways to to get you started. But I I'm I'm a big proponent, like, hey, what I do works for me, but I'm not saying that's going to work for you or, or anyone else. Cause I think that's important. Cause like you said, people are going, here it is. It's the aha, like, that's it. That's the thing. And they chase these trends and whatever. And maybe to a degree, even here, I'm a little bit guilty as charged, but I, I had a little bit of intentionality, right? I was like, okay, yeah, I could, I'm always exercising. I, I recognize this, this potential burning body fat, you know, and I want to come back to that too. But man, I would just, because we've got the opportunity that came up, like everyone should know, man, like, don't just adopt frameworks and all this stuff because it exists, right? In in what you said and what I the way I like to word it is know what you're solving for, right? It comes back to the clarity piece. Like don't just do yeah. something to say you're doing it. Like what are you solving for? And then decide is it a fit, right? Like I'm just gonna start fasting. Well, why? Like what what yeah. are you solving for? You know, and and if you challenge yourself in to establish that clarity. And that's one of the Lions Guide core values, establish clarity for that reason, because then you can set the intentionality and you can measure its success. You can say, yeah, this is working and it is doing what I thought it might do, or it's not doing what I thought it was going to do. Yeah. So I need to, you know, check back in and figure out what I want to do next or whatever. The, this is a perfect place for a little case study, if you will. I had a patient come in new to me, right? And she was pregnant. And she wanted to come in to talk about nutrition, but really what she wanted to come in to talk about was fasting. And I was, I was flawed. Um, so I had to ask her some questions. Okay, why do you want to fast when your body is trying to build another entire human being? Yeah. It's like yeah. how much, <laughs> you know, you are going through an extremely stressful metabolic state. You are demanding so much from your body and, you know, Let's pull some other levers. How about protein? I mean, this is the building blocks of life. You know, protein as the word means primary. That's what the pro means. This is what we need to focus mm. on. So if you're not meeting your basic protein needs because you're doing a, you know, 16 eights and you can only eat a small amount because anything more than that makes you nauseous because you're pregnant. Well, how healthy is that baby going to be? So let's sure. pull it back, you know. So right there, that intentionality, you know, that's the thing. So why would people fast? Why would they want to restrict their eating window, I think, is a, is a very important question. And most often the reason is these days it's a desire to lose weight. And then the other reason is this supposed enhancing of autophagy. And you have to look at that individual, right? And decide, okay, what kind of approach is going to work for them? And so just being told what to do and follow someone else's protocol is not seeking to understand. It's just like, tell me what to do, doc. Yeah. And as doctors, we step into that role because that's what we're taught. You know, you're the expert. People are going to come to you. They want to know what to do. So what do we do? We tell them what to do. Now, how well does that work? Not very well because most people truly don't really want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just want to be, they just want some agreement that the idea was right. Sure. So what I try to do is really have people understand what the mechanism is. What are we trying to achieve? So with weight loss, 
absolutely it's going to end up in a caloric deficit. You're going to eat a little less if you're restricting your window, especially if you start paying attention to snacky snacks. And, you know, I, I sent a blog post your way that talked about the nine kind of steps to longer fast, but that's the nine steps I would recommend to anyone, even with just restricting the time restricted, you know, time restricted eating window, just restricting that window takes some training. And the weight loss is super, super important for some people, but that's not really what they want to do. They want to burn excess body fat. They don't want to lose weight. You don't want to lose muscle mass. You don't want to lose bone mass. You don't want your hair to fall out. That can, that can also be weight loss. You know, you want to yeah. burn fat. Yeah. So let's think about what are we trying to do? How are we enhancing that fat burning process? Fasting can or restricting your eating window can definitely do that. It gives your body a reason to tap in and look for energy resources, but it's going to prioritize glucose. So if you're just, you know, drinking sodas and you're eating window and you're eating a bunch of starchy carbs and you're not meeting your protein needs and you're not getting good quality, healthy fats, you're probably never really going to enhance autophagy that much. You know, you're probably just going to get hungry and hangry. Yeah, because hangry. You're, rolling, you're riding a <laughs> roller coaster, right? So yeah. I think that's the main reason why people want to do it. And I think it's a very good tool. But yeah, I, you uh, you hit on two things that, that I wanted to bring up, which was, was there truth in that, right? That That my body hits a fasted state and it starts burning body fat. And that's, that's what I think. That's what I think I'm hearing you say is like, you're triggering your body to say, Hey, I, you're not chewing on, you know, uh, active fuel, whatever I just food or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. So you need to go tap into the reserves is, is, is there, is there, is that what's happening basically? Like, you know, that doesn't have any food fuel anymore. So now it's going to the body fat reserves. Yeah, ideally, that is what's happening. I mean, it, it can look like different things in different individuals. You know, if, you, if you're if you a lean bodybuilding type, you're me very metabolically flexible. You're exercising like a fiend and burning lots of calories. You know, anything more than a 12-hour fast probably doesn't suit your benefits because you, your body is trained to seek fuel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But for most of us, we're sitting... On our duffs, you know, if you look at people's activity level, they get up, they eat something, they sit down, drive to work, sit down at work, eat something, sit down, come back home, eat something, sit down, go to bed. I mean, it's unfortunately the case for a large percent of the population. So in that situation, what they're feeding themselves and what their body is demanding from them, they don't match. You know, and so they need to say, okay, am I eating for my activity level? <laughs> if I'm exercising all the time, yeah, carbohydrates may, even simple carbohydrates may serve a real good purpose. But for most of us, we don't need that fast burning fuel all the time. And then we get into kind of this fat forward kind of eating, even, you know, in the therapeutic ketogenic lifestyle. And that, that has its, its purpose. It's another tool, you know. Fasting and ketosis go together because of metabolic flexibility. You will produce ketones and generate energy from fat for your brain, for your heart, and all of those kinds of things once you're no longer burning carbohydrates for that mm. reason. So it's looking at just fuel sources. You know, the major fuel sources are your carbs and your fats. And some people like to simplify it, fast burning fuel versus, you know, the slow, steady burn state. And I think there's truth to that, but everyone has to has to know where they're starting. And this is bio-individuality. It's actually the first tenet of nutrition. When I used to teach bioscience of nutrition to functional nutrition students, that's the first thing we talk about. Hmm. There's no such thing as a standard recommendation that covers sure. everyone, right? It's bio-individuality. And that, and that comes up to like, their genetics, their disease predisposition, their health state, their, you know, their goals. It's all, it's all very important. Yeah. I think it, it is important to know, right? Like it's the whole, it's not a one size fits all thing. I mean, it, look at the diversity in, in humans, right? Like size, yeah. you know, like you said, activity, all that stuff there. It's, it's what's 
what what would work for you for what you're solving for you know you gotta that, that it's i'm glad you bring it up it's really important um you had said earlier because i want to touch on uh you know you you it sounded like you said like even if you're fasting but in your window you're eating a bunch of junk it, it's going to have to prioritize that right so were you saying like so if you're consuming sugars you know or glucose whatever uh, like it's it's got to chew through that before it can get to your body fat like i guess what does it matter what you're eating you know uh, how does that affect the the, the the benefits of fasting or, or restricted eating <laughs> Oh, a loaded uh, one, huh? people, loaded, people hate, loaded question? <laughs> yeah, well, it is because, you know, the the answer that everyone hates when talking about nutrition is it, it depends. Okay, yeah. so it depends. Like if I, going back to my bodybuilder versus my couch potato, you know, the bodybuilder can get up and he can eat like an eight hour window or whatever, and it can be mostly carbohydrates and they burn through it. They, their muscles have glycogen stores that fill up their liver is very metabolically active and it's you know it's not a fatty liver so it's able to process things really really well and they may just you know a couple of hours after they went to bed their body's just like i gotta search out you know <laughs> where are my reserves coming from i've got to repair this mechanism what's out there for my fuel to drive my brain and my heart and things like that. And it, and it can go and find what is needed. Whereas that unhealthy, overweight, disease state individual, they've got to pay, start paying attention to quality of nutrition before they start thinking about extending their fast. Because sure. they've got to, you know, it comes back to those stressors. You know, if, if a, a healthy body has a better job facing challenges and if i'm super disease state sometimes this fast may be the kick in the pants that i need but i'm gonna have to go over here get a little used to that discomfort come back allow myself to reset go a little bit further come back reset go. and then you slowly move to that new norm you know jumping in to a seven day fast can feel like you know Total crap to people. Yeah, I'm sure. They shouldn't do it. Now, I'll give you a little bit of my story because maybe this helps bring it home. You know, I I was working a lot with digestive disorders. And having people not eat is a good way not to experience digestive issues, right? Sure. Yeah. So so this allows the healing mechanisms to to get in place. But if we take that too far people feel worse off and then they'll probably overeat as an overcompensation. Their body yeah. doesn't know what to do. Okay. And so we've got to just look at that. So I used to, you know, we, 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 we want to help the people we used to be. Oftentimes I used to have digestive problems back in the day. So I got really good at solving. I solved my own problems. I never had eczema or psoriasis or anything after I solved that kind of stuff. There was a lot of digestive dysfunction. And I moved more away from those carbs and, you know, I ate, I ate fairly healthy, but certain even like paleo styles didn't suit me. So I ended up going fairly low carb for a while. And then, you know, I was like, oh, I feel awesome. And this is ketosis. This is what it's about. My brain's alive. I feel I can, can go for days without eating. And I did, you know, I would do things like one meal a day. And what happened was that I was like, you know, skinny dude suddenly like really underweight you know i went mm. from like 190 to like 178 or something like that as a six foot two plus person that's like too skinny sure you know i didn't feel awesome my wife's like honey you got bags under your eyes you need to eat a steak or you know eat more often or something like that sure. so i think we what i was coming to is like i got off on that control over hunger because most of my life, I'd just been a voracious eater. I could just eat whatever, whenever. I was metabolically active. But, you know, I'm 50 now, so things slow down a little bit, you know. And I had to look at that and understanding that what served me in the past doesn't serve me now because I'm not the same person. I'm in a different phase in my life. Now I don't have all those hormonal triggers to make me build and maintain lean muscle and lean mass, I have to actually work on it. 
Mm. So I have to prioritize protein more now as I age than when I did when I was younger. I have to stimulate muscle growth and bone metabolism and all that kind of stuff through exercise, you know? So I found I went this way and then I went that way. I did a 36 hour fast. I mean, a three day fast, I'll never do more than a 36 hour fast in my life unless I needed, unless I was really sick, you know? Mm. I don't think I'd do that anymore because I don't think it serves my goals, which is to maintain a healthy, lean body mass and be metabolically fit so I can play with my young kids. Because as a 50 year old with a nine year old, I'm just like, I'm going to be that old dad, you know, (laughs) I've got to stay healthy and fit, you know. So that's what I'm working on these days, you know. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And and I think, yeah, similarly, you know, because the eating part of it, I, Huh, how do I say this? You know, a couple of things that that I can relate to. For example, like when I first started the fasting, you know, I ran into uh, feeling less energetic. I've always been lean, you know, growing up, you know, because my family, especially, uh, you know, my on my father's side, they're all big men, you know, six five ish folks, big, great, big guys, and I always got the you're gonna be as big as your dad, you're gonna be as big as this, and and. I, I'm just skinny dude. Like I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I never broke six foot, you know, as much as I tried, I'm five foot 11 and three quarters. And, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, but I eat, I can eat, you know, I can, I can put some food yeah. down. And, um, so one, I always got the, you know, oh, it's going to catch up to you, you know, it's going to catch up to you, you know, but it never did, you know? Um, so I, yeah. I think the, the one thing you said, like, I, I guess I'm metabolically fit or whatever, like, you know, I'm, I, it feels like I just, my body just burns it out, it, you know, and I, I have the energy yeah. from it. But one thing I was going to bring up with the, 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 the fasting was, um, how it did uh, kind of affect me was like, I cut out breakfast basically. And then I was only eating lunch and dinner, but I was like down, I was running to a wall. Um, so was that because like my body needed the fuel and I cut a meal out because, yeah. and, and now my body wasn't getting what it needed. And what I had to do, I realized I was like, Oh crap. I, I now am eating instead of three meals a day or six times a day, whatever I was doing before I've cut that by half, but I didn't fill in the, my caloric needs basically in, in the middle, in that, in that window. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I I think this is why people do it. They want to consume less calories. And then there's the people like, oh, I've heard about all these other benefits like mental acuity and productivity and leanness and all of that. But then they forget that they need to meet a basic, you know, there's within um, nutrition, we all speak about percentages and ratios, how much fat versus carb versus protein. And that's very vogue to do, especially like, you know, zone dieting and keto dieting and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It focuses on that, but there's an absolute need. There's a, you know, we talk about things that are compared to each other versus absolutes. And you absolutely need a certain amount of protein to maintain a healthy body. So if we get to, you absolutely need a certain amount of, you know, electrolytes and minerals and vitamins in your body. So if we just cut everything out and we're only eating very, very little, then we will, we'll hit a wall. We're not meeting our our absolute needs, you know, versus relative need. Right. And I think that's where we get kind of off track. So it is something to think about. Now, for a short period of time, people can do pretty well on a greatly calorie restricted diet. And then it does catch up to them after sure. a little bit. So, you know, there's a lot of cycling that people do um, with with fasting versus eating, high protein versus low protein, all of those kinds of things. And that just requires awareness and uh, intent, yep. right? Because just eating willy-nilly is not really cycling. It's just like, <laughs> you know, it's it's not intentional at all. But right. if you can do that intent and, and you're handling it really well, that shows that you're metabolically flexible. You can burn fat when carbs aren't available. You can burn carbs when, you know, you're not eating high fat. And, and that's metabolic flexibility. And ultimately, that's where we want to be. Sure. So, so cycling in and out of phases makes sense to me because that's how nature operates. You know, right. we look at, you know, I have tons of birds in my garden. I look at them every single day. We have a 
created the environment for it. But man, they are just really, really busy eating at some parts of the year. And then other parts of the year, you know, the ones that are stuck around, they're eating windows short. They're not out at night, you know. So there's kind of like a seasonal approach to this kind of stuff, too. If I think about nature and my ancestry, and so I'm bringing in genetics and all of that kind of stuff, my family is Anglo-European mutt, mostly Scottish, right? Northerners. <laughs> we didn't eat vegetables. I wasn't eating a salad in the middle of winter. I wasn't meeting my nine servings of greens and <laughs> fruits. All that stuff's kind of made up for whatever reason to kind of cover the baseline for most people, but the human body is amazingly resilient and flexible. And if I think about, you know, I fast more in the winter than Mm -hmm. I do in the summer. Mm -hmm. I'm more active in the summer. The foods that are available regionally in the summer, they're not high fat. They are higher carbs, you know, I'm talking fruits and all those kinds of things. And then as we move into the later part of the seasons in the fall, that's when nature is mixing fat and sugar together. All the animals have become fat, you know, the the fruit like the apples and the melons and all of that kind of stuff is, is right there. So people typically nuts and all of that kind of stuff seasonally that was ready for you to take you into the lean times of winter. Right. Where you would fast more, you'd be eating more fatty foods. You wouldn't be getting a lot of like fast burning carbs. You know, maybe you made something out of grains that were molding from the yeah. fall harvest, you know, but that was about it. And yeah. I, I like to think about these things as, as nature because we are natural beings. And I think what we're seeing now in the advent of just these chronic modern diseases is we just separated ourselves so much from nature. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that seasonal variation is important and fasting or time restricted eating is part of that. You, yeah, you, I you, you mentioned that, like you read a blog post right at the beginning of this podcast, right? When talk, yeah. people are talking about ancestral stuff, and they're right. I mean, you didn't wake up and open up the refrigerator and pull out something. You had to go and get your food, or you're eating last night's leftovers, which you were probably heating on the the fire. You were expending energy before you even ate. Yeah, you know. And then at night, you weren't hanging out late night, you know, trying to keep fires going so you could sit around and eat till 10 o'clock, you know, everything had, a, everything was a finite availability. So you went with it, you made what works. And right now we just, everything's available to us all the time. Including yeah, we're food. living in the, we're living in the comfort zone. It gets more and more comfortable every single day. But I thought that was a good call out though, right? Like in the summer, we're so much more active, but it's like the winter poundage you know, and that you were saying that I'm like, yeah, that makes total sense because, you know, we eat heavy all summer. We're going we're, like it's daylight more. We're out longer. We're up later. And then if you carry that eating habit into the winter when you're not doing all those things, of course, you know, and there you are, yeah. you, you, the cycle repeats, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to burn it all off in time for summer again, you know, but, but, but reality is if you, if, with that awareness, right, how busy you are, your body is calorically burning more and yeah. as you fade as we fade through fall into winter and you're slowly not right you need to adjust yeah. your diet to co- compensate you need to adjust yeah yeah and and i think this is kind of topical you know we're going to come to the end of summer here people are going to move into the fall hopefully get back to regular schedules then this winter is here and that's when we celebrate with food and company and wine and whatever most of most people overindulge from basically October 31st through to the new year, right? They overindulge, yeah. which is kind of interesting because animals, and we're animals, but all the other animals, they do the opposite. Mm. They eat less and they lose weight in the winter time, right? Mm. And I think that for most of us, we are just like, okay, I've, I'm eating for winter, leading up to winter, you know, to pack on the pounds, but we don't do that. We shift that season and, and we don't eat for winter. We eat like it's for winter all year long. We don't have a seasonal approach to it. And, you know, I, I, I don't get weird about this stuff, Dale. I'm not like super, oh, well, it's not in season. I'm not touching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. don't, but it's, it's just kind of a thing that, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to think about. Because if I want to be a natural, healthy being living in a natural world, 
as much as possible, why not follow some of the seasonal variations? I, I don't subscribe to like, just pick a diet and stick to it because I don't think that's natural. I think, mm. you know, we should go with the flows. Maybe there's some times where, you know, springs around and I think like, okay, well, my ancestors, all those animals burnt off their fat over winter. It's like the animals are leaner. The, the greens aren't starchy. They're all like salads and bitters and all of that kind of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. It depends where you are. I mean, if you grew up in the tropics and there's always fruit hanging from the trees, you'd probably have a different ancestry. You'd probably have different mechanisms to handle things. But we, we're in a mixing pot these days, and we're mixing all sorts of things together. You know, our genetics are mixed. Our, our environment is very, very mixed. And so just bringing some awareness to it and thinking about it through that kind of ancestral lens that you mentioned at the beginning, I think yeah. that's the way to think about fasting. So I don't do a 10 hour fast at this time of a 10 hour eating window at this time of year i pretty much eat 12 and 12 Mm. because i'm more active i'm done eating by 6 30 in the evening i probably eat sometimes as early as 6 30 but most of the times it's a little bit before eight but in the winter i might push it you know it's darker earlier i want to eat earlier Mm -hmm. that circadian rhythm triggers me man i was just like okay let's see if we can get the kids to sit down at 5 30 tonight and we can finish up dinner and then i'm tireder and i go to bed earlier in the winter and i wake up in the morning and it's dark outside i don't want to eat you know i'm at the 47th parallel or whatever it's dark (laughs) you know and then in the summer the sun's up till like 10 at night the sun is just it's bright outside and i don't want to go to bed as early and so i think there's there's some rhythms there that we resist and if i i like the idea of winter fasting and getting more on a fat forward kind of diet in the winter it keeps me lean through winter and then i don't have to do my my bikini body boot camp <laughs> in the spring right because it, <laughs> i'm good i'm good you know yeah, I think that's awesome. And I, and, and yeah, it's, it's even for me, right. Cause I've been lockstep like year round, you know, 16, eight, but you know, but you're, but you're right. I mean, and I think that goes back to the, I think the core of anyone gets anything out of this fasting, not fa- whatever is just open your eyes up that your body is a system, right? It is a machine. It it's, it's a system of processes and you got to be aware of that and, and understand like how you're affecting that system, whether it's fasting or what you're eating. Um, and I wanted to come back to it because I'm, I'm not sure I asked it before, but like the effect of eating, like say the high sugar, th- like, so you're fasting, but you, you, I spend my eight hours eating donuts versus eating good food. What is it? What, you know, cause I, look, I did that. I, 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 I did that like, especially at one point, you know, especially when, I was exercising a ton, training for marathons, running, you know, 14 mile days, stuff like that. I'm eating whatever I could get my hands on. Didn't care. I I would dust that box of donuts. I would dust that, you know, box of Oreos and I'd still eat the steak dinner. Um, But what is, you know, you mentioned earlier about like your body processing sugars and stuff um, versus, so you know, is it, so, is it taking more yeah. of the body to process the poisons? What are the poisons that don't serve us, you know, in, in the system, so to speak? Well, you know, first and of I, all, and, and I, and I remember you said about the, you know, the lean guy versus what we need to do, but I guess my question yeah. is more around, like, what are the things that we kind of want to avoid that aren't helping that system? Like the things that it's got to go, you, you said earlier, what triggered me on this is like, I was like, I'd love to get to the storage, but you just fed, fed me this. I got to worry about this. Yeah, like, what, yeah, what is that? Yeah. What's, what is that stuff? Well, I, I think that mostly what, what I'm talking about, and, and I don't really want to qualify foods as you know sinners or saints too much because it, it gets political very quickly. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, there is no secret that a bunch of refined sugars isn't good for you. But the I think even a bigger culprit is probably a lot of industrialized fats and seed oils. And that's pretty, you know, controversial too, but we mix those two together most often, you know, know, high fructose corn syrup wasn't in the American diet prior to the seventies. Things like canola oil wasn't around like it is today. 
soy oil wasn't around like it is today. And these things aren't naturally available to us. Mm. So I think those do clog up the system a little bit. It's kind of a evolutionary mismatch, if you will. I'm not saying that you can't ever eat those things, but I think it's just, once again, looking at it. But my point about that comment earlier is that if you want to have a successful fast, you got to get off the blood sugar roller coaster mm. because otherwise you're going to be bonking. Because what you've done is when you feed a very um, carbohydrate rich, refined carbohydrate diet, you upregulate all those mechanisms that handle sugars and you downregulate the mechanisms within your body that handle, you know, more complex carbs and fats and things like that, your body is going to match to the substrate that you feed it. Mm. And we're talking about digestive enzymes. We're talking about how good your muscle mass uh, is at burning fat, where fat ends up settling, like in the liver and all of those kinds of things. So if you can get off of that junk food roller coaster, you will have a more successful fasting experience. You'll have a more beneficial fasting experience. I'm not saying you can't do it, but how how do you want to feel while you're doing it? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and that's kind of the training wheels, you know. So, like, I, I say, you know, you want to be benefit from stable blood sugars. And fasting can help you get there, but you can probably uh, get the groundwork set, you know, so reduce with intent to eliminate like sugary foods, really wide eating windows, just start to bring them down a little bit. And then you want to cut and shift towards that more healthy food. So when you are not eating, you're supporting yourself. And, you know, alcohol doesn't really have a place in this. You don't want to be drinking on an empty stomach. Everyone's done that before and you realize how drunk you get and how crappy you feel. So you got to clean up the diet a little bit, you know, and you got to, you don't have to get crazy, but understand why you're doing it. And I, I should hope that people want to feel healthier and better. That's right. why they want to do it. They don't want it just a badge of honor, you know, like, oh, I did a three-day fast. Boy, that was tough. That's rough. I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> what did that serve you, you know? Right. So I, I think yeah. that it's important questions to ask. Yeah, I think, and, and that's awesome because that was my experience, right? I did have a noticeable difference, but I think you touched on something too that I want to come back to, but I did have a noticeable difference of like, hey, I'm running 14 miles a day. I can eat whatever I want and versus... I'm running 14 miles, but I'm eating healthy, you know, instead of the burger, you know, three whoppers from Burger King, I went and got steaks and vegetables and all that and, and proper yeah. carbs and stuff. I did feel different, right? I did, you know, sure. Mm -hmm. I might've been burning, you know, a thousand calories a day and working out or whatever, but you know, I, I noticeably felt different, but by, by what I was, what I was eating, which yeah. I, I, you know, you, you definitely feel it for sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, it's all part of the same thing. You know, fasting is kind of the flip side of feeding, but that feeding has to be thought about sus as sustenance. Like, what am I doing to build this awesome body up? Cause that is truly why we should be talking about nutrition. Yeah, being like, intentional. How can I be better? Be, yeah. be intentional, you know? And as high-performance coaches, that, that's our, our, our bag, right? We want intentionality. Yeah. We want a goal to achieve. And some people's goal may be to be leaner, but other people's goal is probably just to feel better, yeah. to function more uh, clearly cognitively or not to have joint pain and all of that kind of stuff. And that's where the restricting the eating window can really help you is to kind of figure out what works for you. It's, it's pushing the envelope for some yep. people. It's definitely pushing the envelope, but how can we become stronger? Well, we have to exercise. We have to put ourselves out of our comfort zone a little bit. And I think that, and that's where that plays an important role. Yeah. And I love the fact you called out like your system, you know, easing into these changes, right? Because, you know, if, if you are eating, you know, 15 hours a day and you're eating poorly for those 15 hours versus, okay, tomorrow I'm going to start only eating for eight and I'm going to eat all healthy. Like, it sounds like you were saying like your body is acclimated to the way you were and you need to slowly balance that out 
Um, you know, cause you know, obviously just habitually, you know, I, I felt like it, it that, that kind of triggers the fact that your body's going to reject that quick cold Turkey flip, you know, cause it's, it's adapted. It sounds like for what you've been doing to it and you didn't ease into something different. You totally went cold Turkey and now your body's going WTF. Like what are we yeah. doing? And and now it's fighting against you in a, in a degree to, to not, not make you successful. Right. You quit faster yeah. basically is what I'm getting to. Is that well, true? We, exactly. It, it works for a lot of things that we do to improve our health. I mean, you look at people who are like, yeah, I'm going to start waking up at five 30 in the morning. Right. And then suddenly they're doing that. And I'm going to go swimming first thing when I get up and I'm going to go to the gym and all that kind of stuff. They don't even have a transition phase in the plan. They, they just have a goal and mm -hmm. reaching the goal is the most important thing. And that's where it breaks down because yeah. they didn't create systems and allow some grace and some healing because no matter what we do to stress the system, which can be beneficial, we have to support the system. Mm -hmm. in many ways. And and fasting is a stress, just like eating is a stress. And our body can rise to the occasion if we allow it to, right? Yeah. You know, the, and I, I, I want to clarify the word stress. Stress sounds awful to people these days, but there's eustress and distress, right? Yes. And so, you know, people think about this distress most of the time, but eustress is like that stress that feeds you that yep. makes you better bigger stronger whatever you want to be like you go to the gym that's stress that's breaking down man when you're in the gym you're just breaking things down you're not building anything you go home you eat you rest that's where your body builds yep and that's that's the kind of stresses that we we got to just think about what am i trying to build out of this experience and that can be a mental thing it can be a physical thing it can be whatever I, yeah and i love the that's a great way to look at it, actually. Like when you're in the gym, you're not building anything. You're breaking down. The building happens, what you do after. But like I actually really love that because it, it it emphasizes the necessity to do that, you know, outside of the gym. It, you know, it emphasizes the necessity of that, right? The rest, yeah. the the proper nutrition that supports what you're doing, the growth, or like say the, your intentions with it. I, I think that's a great way to put it. I've never really heard it that way, but I, I, I'm definitely going to use it. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. I used to be a personal trainer and I, I had a client once and like, I come to the gym three days a week and I want to work with a personal trainer because honestly, I like pizza and beer. And I'm like, <laughs> fine. Your buddy's going to look like someone who likes pizza and beer. You know, yeah. it's, it's a different kind of mentality. And that's the calories in, calories out kind of idea about exercise and food, which is, is fraught with problems because of the quality of the fuel allows the quality of life, you know. And, and I think it all, it all comes back to that kind of looking at what you want to get out of it. Yeah. It's a, I, I, I've, I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but, you know, I think that's really what we need to, to think about. I, I, you're not, I, I say it all day long, right? Like, what are you solving yeah. for? It's so important to just know that fact. Like, what are you solving for? Why are you doing this? It, it's, I don't, I don't think we can say it enough because I, I think, you know, we're, there's just too many people running into walls, chasing cars. It's like, it goes back to like the dark night when a joker's like, what's he say? Uh, I'm like a dog chasing cars. So I, I don't know what I'm doing when I get one, you know, like it's like people are just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. it's that, that kind of whole thing. What, if, what we've talked a lot about the, the body and fitness and health, but what about neuro neurologically, you know, as far as fasting is concerned, like what, what is that? Like, I know for me that I do feel better. I do feel more clear, you know, friends that I know that do maybe more of the longer stent fast, talk about how much they feel more clear mentally and all that stuff. Um, where does that play in? Like, what do you, what's happening to, for that effect? Well, that actually comes down to the state of ketosis quite often. Um, the brain actually really digs ketones to use, and ketones are manufactured by your body through your liver when you're burning fatty acids as fuel. So your body starts to break down and hydrolyze fats, and you produce ketones, and that can fuel the brain. It can make you feel more sustained. And this may be, some people suspect this is kind of an evolutionary mechanism, you know, when, when you were hungry and you couldn't, you hadn't had a kill in a couple of days and food was sparse, you had to be mentally alert, you know, mm -hmm. otherwise you pray, you're not going to function very well. So your body can actually 
use those things as energy and the brain likes it. Um, the problem with, you know, riding a blood sugar roller coaster is that's brain fog for a lot of people. People don't react very well to that. I mean, probably everyone's probably experienced something when you, you know, went to the spaghetti factory for, you know, company lunch and you all came back and you wanted to snooze in the middle of the day, you couldn't think straight, you know, that, that may be just that natural inclination to kind of want to take a nap in the afternoon, but it's exacerbated by a blood sugar spike and then insulin is overshot and brings the, the glucose down too much. And then you kind of in this reactive hypoglycemia and that can be, you know, problematic for a lot of people. Uh, there's another hormone, glucagon, that kind of rides insulin together. So if you have more protein as a protein snack uh, based lunch, you probably won't experience that as much. Mm. But um, that that comes, you know, to the carbs versus ketones. We can all manufacture ketones pretty easily, but it's not going to happen in the space of elevated insulin and glucose. So that comes back to that earlier question, you know, don't feed yourself the crappy stuff if you want to be a successful faster because your body is going to not want to tap into those reserves as insulin elevated. Mm. And maybe that's a mechanism I could have brought up. I don't like to get super into mechanisms with people. I just mm. want to use logical conversation. Yeah, um, yeah. But but people like to go into mechanistic um, ways these days. I think the population's mm educated and maybe miseducated on this kind of stuff a little bit more, but you know, you can definitely tap into fat fuels better if your insulin levels are down. Mm. And if you're eating a lot of carbs all the time, your insulin levels are elevated to keep the blood glucose in a normal range. So, you know, looking at bringing insulin down so that your body can burn fat as fuel, fuel the brain, I think that's an important part of it. And, and that's why you see fasting in like the metabolic sense. And there's Jason Fung and his group where they do really extended fast for the metabolically sick and the diabetics. They want to bring insulin down. Mm -hmm. Insulin is not a bad hormone, but it's just, you know, people are hyperinsulinic. They, their insulin is just high all the time and they, they, they have a hard time accessing fat as fuel. And um, so to get back to the original question, the ketones are part of that aspect, and you don't have to be following a ketogenic diet. Your body will manufacture that if you're in this healthy, low insulin state in mm. an overnight fast. Um, is it elevated ketones? Is it you know therapeutic ketosis? That doesn't really matter for somebody like you and me. This may be more beneficial for someone in a disease state to get into that therapeutic ketosis. Mm. Um, the other thing is sometimes a little bit of a stress hormone release, right? Your body's hungry. We ignore this, the, the mechanisms. Your heightened senses, basically driven by adrenaline, nor, nor adrenaline, whatever, your, your, your hormonal level changes, you know? And um, that can turn someone's brain on sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. that little bit of stress. I mean, we've all experienced that. We had a little bit of a stressful situation and suddenly you're alert, right? You're aware of everything around you, and th that can be concentration and, and and stress, and how you adapt to that is important. Yeah, and th th that's another part of it. Some people feel super wired and intense when they're in a fasted state. You know, the the OMAD people are really into this, the one meal a day kind of folks. They they feel that like by noon, you know, there's a stress a hormonal response to like not having food since seven o'clock the previous evening. And they just suddenly a little bit more alert. Right. And then they have this like one hour, two hour eating window in the evening. And of course they got to They've got to meet that caloric need. They got to meet that basic protein needs. They got to meet the, you know, mineral needs. And I, I'm not a big fan of OMAD for some individuals. I think if you're super high performing physical prime, you can probably handle it. For a lot of people, they'll tend to overeat and stress the digestive system and then trying to sleep with, you know, 2,000 calories in the belly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I don't think that's good for restful sleep, you know. And that comes back to circadian rhythms and all of that kind of stuff, which we yeah. don't need to necessarily address now. But So yeah. to kind of start bringing it around, like what are, what are some do's and don'ts, you know? You know, for example, 
I've learned that you got to come off the fast in, uh, in a delicate way, you know, and then you probably appreciate what I'm saying, but I'll, I want yeah. your version of it. Um, you know, since you were in digestive health, like what, um, you know, what, what are the do's and don'ts to include? How do you, how do you come off the fast? Well, I think this is dependent upon how long we're talking. I think if, you know, in your case, uh, 16, eight, you can probably be pretty good about just taking time to sit and smell your food a little bit, appreciate what's sitting in front of you. And that triggers the cephalic phase of digestion and gets everything ready. Mm. So on the flip side, you don't want to pull up to a fast food window, grab something and start eating it in your car on the way home, right? That's just not a good way to break the fast. Be because why? What happens? You haven't stimulated the biochemical cascade that happens with just reflecting on food and smelling food and thinking, preparing your body is a subconscious mental thing that happens. It's, it's a physiological mechanism. And this is called the cephalic phase of digestion. Cephalic being, meaning head. And it triggers a hormonal cascade to trigger the stomach to start producing the acids and, and, the, and uh, your secretions that need to ready the stomach to receive food. Mm. So that's one thing to think about is just like get your body primed. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a little bit of a taste of something before you start shoving the whole Whopper or burrito in your mouth, right? <laughs> you just want to taste something and savor it and your salivary glands start pumping and your stomach juices. That's one thing to think about because that's yeah. setting your body up to receive. The other thing is if you've extended your fast and you're like low on the blood glucose, you know, it's 36 hours, 72 hours, whatever you've done, I would start with something like maybe a little bit of broth. You know, if you've used broth throughout your fast, because some people consider that fasting and I'm totally okay with that, you want to train your body, you know, just taking a little something to stimulate that appetite, stimulate those secretions. Don't take in a bunch of sugary stuff. You're not going to break your fast with a Pepsi or Coke. That would just be harsh on the system. You'll feel like junk. You might feel energized in the meanwhile, but, <laughs> you know, a little while later, you're going to feel like junk. So I, I would say just be aware, um, take your time, eat a nice, good meal, but uh, think about that physiology. You know, what are you doing to your body? Prepare yourself. It's, it's, it's that intent, you know, it's a, that laying things out. So that would be the one thing I recommend. Um, you might, depending on what your situation is, you might want to eat a smaller meal and then come back and have a larger meal later, depending on how long that fast was. Yeah, um, I love that. I never thought about the, you know, and I'll have to go back and listen to what you said the system is, but I never, I never knew that, but I, I would, I'll break with like a, a yogurt, like I'll, before I run in and, you know, cause I start eating at noon before I run in and start cramming it down, you know, I'll sit down, I'll just have you know, some Greek yogurt, you know, and just take that in, wait a few minutes and then I'll start actually eating or else I just found I have, I've just had digestive problems on the other yeah. side of that. So, so you're yeah. doing that small little piece of something that's pretty easy. It's a, yeah. a yogurt is a partially digested food, right? You got those <laughs> enzymes working on those, those molecules within, and that's what makes that fermented. So that can be a partially digested food. It's a little easier in the system as opposed to yeah. just jumping right into like, you know, eating corn off the cob, it might not work as well, you know, for some sure. People. So awesome. Anything, any yeah. else do's and don'ts? There's no metal. Okay. That's given to brutalizing yourself and taking a fast <laughs> so long that you're uncomfortable and starting having heart palpitations and want to call the ER. So don't do that to yourself because I've spoken to people who've done crazy stuff like that. There's no metal. Okay. So I think that's the biggest don't is don't put yourself into such a state of stress that you have to abandon everything. Mm. Take, treat it with, you know, take your time, give yourself some grace and learn from it. That's the biggest thing I think is learn from the experience, no matter how you try it, you know, because if you're not learning, yeah, it's kind of a waste. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And it, it goes right back to the intentionality and, yeah. and, and finding what suits you, you know, it's like, yeah. why are you doing it? And, and how do you serve that? Why in your, your world, right? You know, regardless yeah. of anybody else, anything else, like learn how your system works, learn where you want to be and how to use your system properly to, to get where you want to be. Yeah. 
That's good, man. I, 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 I like this conversation. I think we, we, uh, we covered a broad variety of topics and probably got more into nutrition and sustenance than would be expected when talking about fasting. But I think, you know, they, they same side of a coin, opposite sides of the same coin. But, um, I, I think that the other thing to remember is that fasting is a tool in your toolbox. And there are so many tools that people can use to um, improve their health, you know. And I, if you don't mind, I, I, I'd like to share an acronym that I like to use. Please. And it's called PROMISE. And I, I believe that we have a lot of promise, right? This, this idea of potential that when we are born and we offer this gift of life, we have so much promise and how we deliver that promise is how we carry our health through in our life. And pattern is super important. So the P in promise is for pattern. This is about your rhythms. This is about your habits. This is what your subconscious versus your intentionality and all of that kind of stuff, how you set yourself up. The R in promise is for recuperation. Give yourself some time to really recuperate. So many of us are doings, right? We're not human beings anymore. We do, 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 do. We drive ourselves crazy. We're consuming constantly, mm. media, everything. We don't give ourselves enough time to recuperate. That could be as simple as closing your eyes for a few minutes in the middle of the day. You know, not taking a nap, just breathing, whatever. Sleeping well is very important. The O is for operator and operation. I think that we understand more about how our cell phone works in our human body. There's like mm. a willful ignorance here and the human body doesn't have to be complicated you know i think we science we love to complicate things and that doesn't serve us but take a little bit of time just to understand a little bit about you the operator of this amazing mechanism you know how can you control the operations the m is for movement look at all these joints the human body is made to move right we got so many muscles and and it, it's a, it's beyond just exercise and and it's it's a physiological drive everything works better if the body moves you know your brain functions better everything functions better circulatory system your vascular your cardio um your respiratory system it all is dependent upon movement mm -hmm. and then uh so there's p-r-o-m <laughs> i is for intimacy i think this is a big part is like intimacy with self understanding what i want from myself and how my relationship with myself serves the relationships that I want to have with others, with others. And that relationship with self is about how we treat ourselves with food oftentimes, you know? So there's an intimacy that we have to develop of understanding what our true wants and needs are, what we want to get from this life. And I think that plays out into me being a better person, helps those I care about be better people, right? Mm -hmm. And then the S is for sustenance, which I mentioned before. I don't like to use the word nutrition. I don't like to talk about calories. I think let's talk about building you up, man. Yeah. What is going to sustain you? And that sustenance turns into the E, which is the energy, mm. you know, and how we create energy in our lives, how we sustain energy in our lives. And, you know, being a high performer, you know, you understand the, the framework that Brendan Burchard uses. I came up with this, brain, this framework before I even heard of Brendan or listened to him, really. And I was just like, man, this, he's talking my language because I feel like that energy that we sustain and bring is dependent upon all those things that I mentioned before. And then that makes us a more enthusiastic individual. We are able to express ourselves better. We are able to live a more fulfilling life. So I like this idea of promise uh, just as an acronym and I've been working with that one, toying around for about a year, and I, I would love to uh, work more with that and help people bring them into a system where we start looking at the promise of health, the promise of this life, you know, and fulfilling our promise to ourselves or whoever else, uh, your creator, your wife, your kids, you know, I think it's yeah. all part of the same conversation. Yeah, I love it. A hundred percent. That's, that's awesome. It, the, uh, and that said, how can people, I know you've got a podcast, you're online. If someone's interested in getting more of more like that, cause that, that was awesome. If you want more, <laughs> more like that. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for asking. Yeah. I have a podcast that I started just to really practice expressing myself and getting over my stuff, you know? So I started that, um, it's called, Building your health esteem, because I do believe that we need oh, to, like that. to believe in ourselves, to be truly healthy. 
Sure. So that's the name of my podcast. It's mostly just me yammering to myself about myself and about <laughs> about my experiences and and dishing a little wisdom. It it maybe is not as much about health, quote unquote, as I intended it to be, but a lot more about mindset and how we interact in the world. Because I think that's super important to building health. And then um yeah, I'm just drjeromecraig.com is my website. And honestly, I haven't worked on my website for years. So I'm going to do that because I'm, you know, I want to do more coaching. I want to do more coursework. I used to teach courses online and now I'm moving over to the Kajabi platform, which you're familiar with, I think. And mm -hmm. so I would like to um, get a new membership program up and uh, I'll send you a link if you're willing to share that with your visitors and your listeners. Um, and it's going to be about the promise framework and a membership. And I'm a doctor. I've got tons of knowledge to share. And I've got a lot of good questions to ask people so they can find their own true path to health themselves. So I appreciate that allowing me to plug that. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, send me all the links. I'll make sure it's all in the show notes. But I love that. Build your health esteem. It's, that That's freaking awesome. I, I, because, you know, the more healthy you are, the better you feel, man. It's, it's, Bottom line, you know. Bottom line, man. Bottom line. I, I, I feel much better at the age of 50 than I did in my late 20s where I was a skinny fat guy drinking too much and eating pizza <laughs> and not really thinking about things, you know, just reacting to life instead of being proactive in life. And I, I think that, um, you know, maturity came probably a little late in my life. But I'm so sure. thankful that I have a family and a bigger purpose to live for now, you know, because yeah. that, that, Definitely, I think I'm I'm a better person for it, having a mission to serve. Definitely, yeah, no, that's awesome and good for you. And and thanks for sharing all this, man. It's been a great episode. Uh, thanks for coming on. We'll get all the contact info out there, so people can come out there and get some more. And and I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. I had fun, Dale. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doctor <laughs> Jerome Craig. Everybody, look him up, follow. Talk to you soon, bud. Thank you very much, Dale. Take yep. care.